The next word I'd like to talk about is the word glory. The word glory is used a lot. Folks, this is going to be uh, clip number 18 and then clip number 21. Uh, my apologies, but this is about, this is John Crowder. To my surprise, he has grown in popularity. He's not one of the big boys, but he is, he continues to find access, as you will see, into churches. This is clip number 18, John Crowder experiencing the drunken glory. Whatever that is. Oh, yo, yo, yo. I am going to wreck because. You know, they, they say when you, you put two, two users together. And see, when Winnie gets up here, and then you expect me to get up and say coherent words later, afterwards. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, dear Jesus. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Yes, Lord. I've learned a, a quick prayer. I'll teach it to all you really quickly. Okie dokie, Lord. Okie dokie. Lord, I love your heavy, drunken glory. Uh, Lord, I love it. Lord, thank you, Father, for more of a heavy, weighty, drunken glory in this house today. That's the drunken glory. This is clip number 21. This is a church we are going to be talking about in more detail. It's in Redding, California. I know we have some pastors here from Redding, California. This is a movement that is very, it's extraordinarily large. Uh, it's Bethel Church. And this is, uh, get ready, everybody. You're going to be in the presence of God. Clip number 21 is the glory cloud comes down from heaven or the ventilation system. Here's... <laughs> That's it. You've just experienced the glory of God. Um, gentlemen? I mean, it's, it's hard to even respond to that, isn't it? It's, it's mind-numbing. It's blasphemous. You know, it, I was thinking as you were showing the clip of Moses, and we were talking about him this morning as a prophet. He wanted to see the glory of God, and he wanted to have the glory of God declared to him. The glory of God is, I mean, the Hebrew word kavod, it's, it's what makes God weighty. It's what makes Him uh, take our thoughts and drive us to the ground and, you know, worship. There's nothing weighty about any of this. It's, it's instead a blasphemy of Him. And what does God do with Moses? He shows him a visible display of His glory, but he, he can't see the whole thing. He has to hide Him. But, but the real display of the glory of God was when He proclaimed His name before Him. It was propositional glory. It was the truth about his character. That's what's weighty about God. And this is just... <clears throat> Tom, I'd add a thought. <clears throat> if that was the glory of God, everybody in the building would be dead. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Everybody. <clears throat> Even Moses couldn't look on the glory of God. The only way that the glory of God could be revealed in the world and people wouldn't die was when it was revealed in Jesus Christ and it was veiled in human flesh. And when, and when Jesus went up on the Mount of Transfiguration, God protected the, the, the disciples that were there and they only went into a coma and not death when they saw the glory of Christ. The veiled glory is manifest in Christ. We see the glory of God. I love Second Corinthians. We see the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ. But it's veiled in Christ as it was veiled to Moses. That, that, that kind of folly, that doesn't get more serious than that. When you start tampering with the glory of God, um, and the guy before that, whoever he is, if that... That kind of behavior, if he, if he hasn't figured out how to do that and make that up, that's demonic. I mean, that's either him really adept at pulling that off or he's under some power and it's not the Holy Spirit. 
Um, before we go any further, I, I just think for the sake of fairness, Steve, if you could just <laughs> stay out of this yeah, for one of yeah, these questions. Yeah. <laughs> Let the other guys have a go. Jump in. <laughs> I'm saving it all for tonight, yeah. okay? I, <laughs> well, yeah, no, I'll hop in. The word glory is used basically in two different ways. There is the intrinsic glory of God, and there is ascribed glory. The intrinsic glory of God is the sum and the substance of all the divine perfections. It is all of God's attributes. It is the fullness of His eternal being. And there is nothing that we can do to add to the intrinsic glory of God nor take away from the intrinsic glory of God. He is the God who was and who is and who shall be forever. He is immutably the same from age to age. And it is the, the sum of His holiness, His transcendence, His independence, His autonomous, autonomy, His sovereignty. His righteousness, His truth, His love, His grace, His mercy, His omniscience, His omnipresence, all of the attributes of God comprise His intrinsic glory. There is ascribed glory, which is the glory we give to God, which is to render to Him the praise and the worship that belongs to Him alone. And the more we understand of His intrinsic glory, the more we will ascribe to Him glory. And so a low view of God leads to low worship, and a high view of God leads to high worship and high and holy living. So what we see here are people who have no knowledge of God or who have so little knowledge of God they don't know enough to get out of. I mean, that was like a bad fraternity party. It's hard to even know how to, to respond to that. They don't even know what the word glory means. They have no concept. They, they have no truth regarding the, the glory of God. Yeah, and that, that first guy, I mean, he, he does have a strange spirit, a different spirit about him, small s. Gentlemen, if, if I could, without being annoying, which maybe we've already Thank crossed you. that line, but I want, to bring this, I want to bring this way, way down for a moment, okay? Because... I think that most of us see things like that, and we just, because of theological training, we just look and go, well, that's just dopey. That's just dumb. But when you engage in a conversation with somebody who is into that movement, I need more than, well, that's, and it is, and that's how I want to respond. Equip me to, in a pithy way, respond to that to help them understand why it's Well, dumb. first of all, if they're in that, we may need to be sharing, or most probably need to share the gospel with them and, and bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I, I don't see how a, a, a born-again, converted, regenerated person would stay in that environment for two seconds, uh, especially given the anointing that we just talked about. I, I w I'd be scared to even be in the building w w with that going on. Um, that, that somehow I'm going to end up being trafficking in some kind of dark, devilish um, uh, but Tell me spirit. why. Okay, so I'm, why? I'm, I'm in this. Okay, I'm, I'm in this. I like jumping around. I don't... Why? Why is this bad? David danced before the Lord. Why is this bad? It's mindless. It's atheological. Um, there, there is no Christ. I mean, John this morning uh, spoke of that first principle from 1 John 4, 2 and 3. It's a magnification of the true Christ. I mean, that, that's just responding to crowd control, as John said, mind-numbing music. Um, it, it, you're just whipping yourselves up. I think you have to be a little emotionally unstable to even want to be in uh, that and to be pulled along into the vacuum of that. You know, the, the thing with David, it's simply that with every faculty, every part of his body, every means he had humanly, he expressed his joy and his gratitude to God. Um, that's very different than that. And, and this speaks to an issue, Todd, that I think Steve nailed. This is why I believe that we are not dividing the body of Christ in this conference. We are trying to identify the body of Christ 
and show that these people aren't part of it. I think the big issue here... You know, uh, <clears throat> people have been hitting the Twitter thing all day, and it was kind of interesting. They told me today that it was the number one hashtag Twitter thing in the world, Strange Fire Conference. So that's pretty interesting. Um, in fact, <clears throat> I, I was told that we were several points ahead of Kim Kardashian. Ooh. <laughs> now we're relevant. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so, but one of the <laughs> one of the criticisms that coming is, this is divisive. These are our brothers. These are our sisters in Christ. They're not. Should we be happy about that? No, we ought to be heartbroken about that. If we want to talk about fire, then we need to talk about snatching brands from the burning. Uh, these people need to be rescued, and one of the reasons that we did this, there's two things in my mind is driven toward this conference. One was the terrible dishonor of the Holy Spirit, so that the reproaches that fall on Him are fallen on me. Um, Zeal for your house has eaten me up, what Jesus said when He cleansed the temple. And secondly, the, the, the reality that these people are lost in this system, and they're throwing the word Jesus all over the place. They don't know the gospel. They don't understand the gospel. So, you know, I got to thinking about that today, and, and I decided that <clears throat> on Sunday morning here, I'm going to give a message on the true gospel and who's really saved, because at the end of the day, this becomes the issue. And I will tell you this, that people can't be saved out of that movement until they hear the gospel. They can't call on the one they don't know. They can't know Him unless they hear. I want to... Um take just a minute to tag along what what John was just saying is that this is very very serious and the people who are in this movement the vast majority of them are not saved and and one of the things that that so confuses and so blurs the line is that they use some of the same terminology but the definitions behind that terminology are very very different it, it's not enough just to use the same lingo it, it, how you teach it how you flesh that out and one of the things that honestly, and I'm going to, I'm about to blackball myself here. One of the things that makes, that makes it so hard to warn people about false teachers is when the, the good guys start associating with the bad guys. And, and they, gi they give these people... Now, what we've seen in these clips is, is extreme, to be sure, but the, the same movement, this Word of Faith charismatic movement, uh, the more, certainly the more um, as you drift towards the Word of Faith, one of the things that so confuses people, I cannot tell you how many times I've heard from people, and they ask me, well, what about so-and-so? I saw him with Paul Crouch. I saw him with uh, Marcus Lamb on, you know, on uh, Daystar and on TBN. It makes it very hard for us to warn people about the wolves when the leaders of the sheep are associating with the wolves. And they give them... Let me... Paul Crouch loves to have the good guys on his set. Loves it. Because the, the good guys give him a level of credibility that he does not have on his own. And Paul Crouch... TBN, Daystar, Marcus Lamb, these guys are the tips of the spears that are exporting this theological poison to the rest of the world. And, and, um, if, if I could for a moment, because I have the gift of encouragement, Justin, um, don't worry, you've been blackballed for years, bro, okay? <laughs> so, nothing's changed. The fourth word... <laughs> 